alvnews.com with the live stream. This is our forum for the candidates for Galveston County Judge. And uh, first off, I want to uh, thank our sponsors of, uh, of tonight's event. First up, the League City Chamber of Commerce. Lori Baldwin, the president of the chamber, is here. And I also would like to thank uh, the City of League City for helping uh, put this together. And, uh, and, and special recognition tonight, uh, uh, Councilwoman Jerry Bentley is here from the City of League City. And I'm not sure if he's still here. I saw Councilman Andy Mann come in a little bit uh, ago as well, but he was also here. We do think the city's been... Oh, and Heidi's coming. I'm sorry, Miss Teeth. There you are. I'm sorry about that, Heidi. Uh, it's come in as well. So thank you all so much for the City of League City. We are, uh, as uh, the county's largest media outlet, we are very pleased to be up in the North County uh, to have this forum tonight. Uh, as we explained in our last forum, but I'll go over them again here now. Uh, the, uh, the rules are pretty simple here. Each of our candidates had a drawing earlier of the order we will go. We rotate throughout the, uh, the, uh, the forum. Uh, each candidate has two minutes for an opening statement, and then we'll start into the questions, and there's one minute response. The yellow light that Lori is controlling there will mean 30 seconds left. The red light means time to stop. I'll let you finish your sentence, but after that, we cut you off. Uh, please uh, press the microphone button and step in and, and, and get in close. Uh, this is being live streamed, and we also will make it available uh, online at galvnews.com. Oh, thank you, Lori, uh, throughout the night as well. All right, so we'll get going here up and uh, first to introduce our candidates and this is how we test the microphones out uh, the incumbent mark henry testing one two thank you and his challenger michelle hatmaker good evening everyone there are no democrats in the in the race but there is a libertarian bill Caroga, who uh declined to participate in the uh forum tonight so it'll just be the two republican candidates uh that'll be in here so we uh drew earlier and uh opening statements for two minutes and michelle hatmaker good evening and thank you for joining us tonight i really appreciate the opportunity to be here my name is Michelle Hatmaker. I've lived in the Galveston Bay Area for over 40 years. I'm a product of the Clear Creek Independent School District, and I've attended local community colleges as well. I've raised my family in Galveston County, and I currently live right here in League City, and I have lived here for 11 years. I'm the broker owner of Real Living, the Hatmaker Group. I am a president and a corporate partner in RH Interests, Inc. I'm CEO of Hatmaker Enterprises, and for many of you that are watching tonight, that's lovingly known as Hatmaker Chiropractic. I'm also a developer on Galveston Island. I currently serve on the Houston Association of Realtors Board of Directors, which is the second largest association in the U.S. with over 27,000 members. I'm the 2014 MLS Advisory Group Chair, which is a wonderful and a very huge responsibility. I've also served on the Bay Area Political Advisory Leadership Group. I'm a member of the National, Feder Federation, Independent, uh, National Federation of Independent Business, the Texas Leadership Council, and I attend Clear Creek Community Church. In my spare time, which hasn't been a lot lately, I'm a member of the Lighthouse Charity Team as well. I'm here today because I believe in open, honest, and conservative governing. I believe in we the people, especially on the local level, that's where governing and activism begins, and it has the most impact. I began this journey over nine months ago and had until December 9th to remove myself as a candidate. And as you can see, I'm still here because I believe in you, and I believe in what I want to do and what I can do for Galveston County. I believe our county judge should be a full-time county judge, and I believe that county judge should lead with integrity, transparency, and honesty. I believe our county judge should, should support law enforcement, and that's why I have just about every law enforcement agency in the county supporting me and endorsing me. I also have other elected officials that are endorsing me, including Cheryl Johnson, the Galveston County Tax Time. Assessor Collector. Time, ma'am. And with his opening statements, County Judge Mark Henry. Good evening. Thank you for coming out. My name is Mark Henry. I am the county judge, the first Republican since Reconstruction, we think. We cannot determine the party affiliation of the judge after Reconstruction, so we're not even positive about that. 
I was uh, fortunate enough to uh, be attend the University of Houston. I graduated in 1987. I applied to and was accepted into the Air Force Officer Training Program. Attended there in 1989. Uh, after that, I spent a year in California, then a th time in Colorado Springs, attending undergraduate space training, and then working about three and a half years in classified satellite operations in Colorado Springs, Colorado. I transferred over to officer training school, and at some point there, I transferred to the Air Force Reserve component. I stayed in the Air Force until 2010 when I was running for county judge, and I had achieved 21 years and time to retire and, and move on. As county judge, we've gotten a lot of things accomplished, and we're very proud of our record. Uh, we do have a, an outstanding record to run on. We have three years in a row reduced your tax rate. We have three years in a row reduced the size of county government. We have two years in a row reduced the public debt that, county, that Galveston County has. At the same time, we have given cost of living raises to employees for the first time in many years. We have uh, begun a path of modernizing county government. One of my last jobs in the Air Force was as a Lean Six Sigma facilitator, and I have been able to employ those skills in county government and reduce uh, inefficiency, reduce waste in government. I don't think anyone here is going to be shocked to find out that government's wasteful by nature. So it's our, uh, our goal to find as much of that as we can and to uh, reduce that. When we reduce the tax rate and save money, it's important to know that we give you the ma that money back. We don't go find a new project to spend it on. So we reduce the amount of money that we take in and we reduce the tax rate and you have kept $14 million in your pocket since I got elected county judge. Thank you. All right, now we'll start the questions. Uh, and Ms. Hatmaker, you'll get the first one to start. One minute on your answers. Explain what experience you have in your professional or public service life that makes you qualified to be Galveston County Judge. Well, as you may have read, I'm an award-winning business owner. A couple of my businesses are actually multi-million dollar ventures. I have very strong business skills. I have a strong marketing background. I also bring leadership qualities that allow me to pull people together in a team effort and a team approach. I'm very conservative in my approach. As you know, it's, it's difficult to make a business work, especially in the difficult economic times that we've had recently. I find that people work well with me. I find that I inspire them to cooperate, and I build a, a, a positive approach into everything that I do. All right. Same question to you, Judge. Same question again. Yeah, sure. The, the question is, explain what experience you have in your professional or public service life that makes you qualified to be Galveston County Judge. Okay, we'll start with the private sector. I have uh, started and built several successful aviation companies. Aviation is a very difficult business to make money in because a lot of people are doing it just to be in the business and they don't care about making any money. Uh, I have uh, got a very successful aircraft parts company in Dickinson right now that my wife Amy, who's hiding in the back back there, has to run every day because I am a full-time county judge and work very long hours. Uh, the professional, or sorry, the uh, while being in office, I have uh, spent time with the Road and Bridge Department. I've spent time with our uh, nuisance abatement officer, Garrett Foskett. I've done a lot of things out with people in the field to see what can be done to do things better. The result of all that is running a more efficient county government similar to how you would run if you owned a business or and some of you do own a business. You don't have your expenses exceed your income, and we have been able to keep a lid on that for three years and we will continue for the next four. All right. And Judge, you'll get this question uh, first. What are your top three priorities for improving the county's infrastructure? Top three priorities for improving the county's infrastructure are going to be pretty large scale projects. One is going to be we have to plan for the I-45 uh, expansion, which will come all the way down to the island at some point. We have to work with TxDOT, and working with TxDOT means you're working in a project that could be five to nine years out to make sure that uh, the I-45 expansion south of uh, NASA Road 1 will go off the way we want it to, do, to go. Number two, the Pelican Island Bridge has gotten a lot of attention lately, and we want to keep it that way. Pelican Island Bridge will be a game changer for the region because it will open up Pelican Island, which is the largest landmass not served by rail and freight anywhere in the United States. And I've said that statement 10 times now, and no one's corrected me, so I feel pretty good about it. Uh, and then finally, we have to have some kind of surge protection. Hopefully, we'll have a longer question that I can answer that. But the, the concept is the Ike Dyke, and we need to have some kind of regional surge protection, uh, something along the Ike Dyke, but something along those lines to make sure that we can continue to build infrastructure and not have it wiped out by a storm. 
All right. Same question to you, Ms. Hatmaker. Well, I have to say that I honestly agree with those components. I do feel that Ike Dyke is of the utmost priority, especially right now with Bigert Waters and the situations that we're dealing with regarding the potential for our flood uh, insurance to increase or to even um, potentially lose flood insurance down the road. Um, I think that the Centennial Gate is not the way for us to, to go, and it will not benefit Galveston County at all. I believe that the Pelican Island Bridge is definitely a priority. With the expansion of the Panama Canal and the immense opportunity that we have coming our way, that definitely is a project that needs to be addressed. And I believe that with uh, the partnership that is pending with Legacy, um, the city of Galveston will be requested to be involved in that, and because of the relationship I have with the city of Galveston and the leaders there, I feel that I can have a great impact on the, the uh, potential growth and change there with the bridge. Time. Um, All right. Uh, since y'all both brought it up in your in last answer, what was going to be a question about Ike Dyke, I'll go ahead and move it on up here uh, a little bit earlier. Ms. Hatmaker, you'll get this first. And, and, and this is more specific. What specific role will the county under your leader, if you elected, under your leadership take to ensure that a surge protection system that's favorable to this county is built? Well, Ike Dyke will involve many components. Obviously, Galveston County can be the leader in moving forward. We will be working with federal and state entities. And Galveston Island itself should be the initial starting point, and then any expansions should come from there. I understand the Six County Coalition uh, is moving forward in with great strides, and I believe that our county, as county judge, uh, I would take a major role in that leadership capability and work with the Six County Coalition and then work with state and federal entities to move from there. All right, and Judge, uh, same question, just a little bit different terminology in that if reelected, uh, what, what specifically uh, role would you take to make sure that, that that happens? Well, that's an easy question. I am the chairman of that six county committee she referenced. Uh, I am taking the lead because I'm the chairman of that committee. We have just received $4 million from the state. Uh, that happened about uh, 60 days ago. That money will be used for a study, and, and I only caution people, don't get a preconceived idea of what the Ike Dyke will be, because the study is going to come back and make suggestions to us. The committee is only chartered to do that study. They are not chartered to do any construction. So once the committee's time or its charter has run its course, we're going to have to redevelop what we're going to do next. But we do want a regional approach to flood control. Uh, there, are, As um, some of you who are very involved know, there was a Rice study that she referenced, the Centennial Gate, which would only protect the Houston Ship Channel. Uh, that has drawn massive criticism, certainly from everyone in Galveston County. And uh, we will continue to make sure that it's a regional protective barrier and not a Houston Ship Channel protective barrier. All right, and this is another IDAC related question to that. Uh, both of y'all have, have voiced your support for a system that would be built uh, starting with the Galveston County system and moving up. How's it going to get paid for, and how much of that is going to come out of the local tax base? Ms. Hatmaker. That is really a question that I am not in a position to be fully knowledgeable out about or to answer. I would believe that it would be a concerted effort between the state and the federal government to come up with the appropriate plan to pay for it. Of course, any measures that would be taken, our local citizens would have to be in the forefront of those decisions. We do not want the burden strictly uh, on our residential our residential property owners. We don't want it strictly on our business owners. It needs to be an effort that is combined, like I said, with state and federal, because in the long run, it will benefit the economy across the nation to protect Galveston Island and our port. And my apologies, I'd gone out of order, but I'll give you a double uh, on this one the next round. But I'll go ahead. The same question to you, Judge. Certainly. There is no way to pay for this other than the federal government. Today's estimate is between 3 and $5 billion. Now make that a government project, and it's $10 billion. Uh, the Galveston County budget's $130 million. We'll never be able to pay for this locally. We can only be a partner to a federal program. Now you say, wow, $5 billion or whatever the actual number comes out to be, that's a lot. It is a lot, but we lost $30 billion from Hurricane Ike. So when you take it to Washington, which I've done three or four times now, and say, we know it's a lot of money, but once the study's done, we're going to come back to you and we're going to ask you to write a check or at least get us going on this project. That amount of money is going to be a very significant uh, investment, but it's going to be small compared to what's going to happen the next time we have a hurricane. And that's one thing we can say for sure. We're going to have another hurricane, just like Ike. We just don't know when it's going to be. I'm hoping for eight years or more from now, but that's just my personal opinion. 
Thank you, Judge. All right, and as I had gotten out of order, so we'll start with you on this next one, Judge. Uh, should the county judge be a judicial and management role or separate it off? If so, how much of uh, the county judge's time should be spent as a court judge and how much time as the county's administrator? Excellent question. Uh, Article 1, Section 5 of the Texas Constitution vests me with certain judicial roles. I've got the only job in the world, and I'm very proud of this fact, I've got part legislature, part judicial, and part uh, um, executive. That's the other branch of government, part executive. Uh, I take that very seriously because the state constantly harps on us to do your judicial function. Um, I do very exciting things like get up at 6 o'clock in the morning to go to magistrate court. Uh, that's uh, another judicial vested function in the county judge. Doing those things, first of all, is very important. Uh, Texas Judicial Education Academy is very glad to see that I started doing it again. My predecessor did not, and that's his decision. The only county judge in this region that doesn't do it is Judge Ed Emmett in Harris County. Doing that allows me the chance to see things like the attorney voucher system and how archaic it is and gives us an opportunity to modernize that system. And there's many more like it. That's the one that just comes to the top of my head. As far as I think it's about percentages, uh, I, the state says, please do at least 40 percent. And I think I manage 40 percent. All right. Same question to you, Ms. Hatmaker. Well, I think this is where we're a, of a difference of opinion. Personally, I feel if you're county judge, that you are the executive CEO of the county, and that's where you should put your efforts. Uh, I have paralegal training. I decided not to go to law school, and I would prefer spend, to spend my time marketing our, our county, working to bring business and economic development. I would prefer to let the judiciary handle the role of judges. Um, and I don't, I have no desire to do that. I've spoken with several of the judges, and they would prefer that as well. All right. All right, next question up. There's been much discussion about uh, public housing issues uh, since Hurricane Ike. The county runs a uh, massive uh, program that's rebuilding houses, but more specifically, and this has been a debate on the island, uh, but what role should the county play if I, uh, in either encouraging or discouraging a more countywide and this may be a good reminder, everyone, Hello. please turn off your cell phones. Uh, what, what, let me ask the question again. What role should the county be playing in either encouraging or discouraging a countywide public housing role? And uh, Judge Henry, you first. Sure, yeah, I was going to give you the double because oh, okay. I messed up before. Okay, sure. Uh, there's two completely different things when we say public housing. Uh, the county has a housing program, which is rebuilding uninsured, underinsured houses. We're very proud of that. Uh, when I took office, we had rebuilt about nine, and that was a little over two years after Hurricane Ike. By the end of my first year, we had finished about 600. Uh, that is different than public housing. Public housing is a situation that the city of Galveston finds themselves in. And unfortunately, uh, it's nothing that the county is going to have a role in. The uh, open government project is very clear. They want public housing moved to Friendswood and League City. That's stated in their uh, presentation that they make. There is no role for that here. But if there is, I go back and say, well, there's infrastructure dollars associated with that public housing. If any public housing were to move to a community on the mainland that wanted it, those infrastructure dollars would have to come with it. There's no point in building a, an apartment complex that has no roads, water, or sewer to service it. But uh, generally speaking, the county doesn't have a role in that. All right, Ms. Hatmaker. And that is correct. The county really does not have a role in, especially the current situation. The city of Galveston is currently in litigation. Uh, the Galveston Housing Authority and the city of Galveston and the federal government are involved in that. The county is not. As far as any potential for the future and any housing issues, public housing issue, issues that we may face throughout the county, I think that if we do need to deal with those uh, situations that we need to look to make the housing available to our veterans. I think that they are definitely a group that um, the county, especially, I mean, you have the, the, the veterans court, you deal quite a bit with veterans. And I think that uh, it's an opportunity for us to focus on helping those that need help. Um, our current administration has clearly said they would not allow public housing in League City. I've heard that with my own ears. And as we all know, it, it may eventually happen, but we just need to do the best that we can to help facilitate an appropriate uh, method of management. And then the county, once again, would be involved with infrastructure. All right, uh, next question up. And Michelle, you get this first. Name one program within county government you think should be cut. Why and how would you go about doing it? Oh my goodness. That's you a very loaded question. 
And honestly, without having data, without reviewing each organization, uh, each county supported entity, it's very difficult to make that call. Uh, what may be appropriate today may not be appropriate when I'm in office in two years. So it's difficult for me to actually answer that concisely. All right. Judge Henry, same question to you. We're mandated to, to perform a number of functions. We can't cut any of those. We have a few discretionary functions, and while we may say that it's not being run very well, it's still a program that's in place. What we have done is taken programs like social services, where we spent more than one dollar for every dollar of direct aid we gave out, and we privatized that to nonprofits. We were able to actually increase the amount of direct aid we gave to the nonprofits while eliminating the overhead that the county uh, bore administering that program. And by the way, that ratio was so bad, we'd be on 60 minutes if we were a nonprofit running a dollar overhead for a dollar direct aid given out. So we can't necessarily and may not want to get rid of the program, but we can take it and put it in the hands of a faith-based nonprofit who will do 10 times better job than we could ever have done. They have a thing called a charity tracker, I think is what it's called. They would know if the person had just come from another charity and received direct aid. The county never had that. The county never knew. They can do a much better job of administering that program. We also outsourced the guardianship program, second to last county in the state to do that. These are things that can be done better by someone else. All right, and uh, next question. What can be done to expand or improve county services in the North County and on the east side of the county? And uh, up first with that is Judge Henry. Be done. Um, the east side of the county is very important because it's largely unincorporated. That's the Bayshore area. And w I am, in, in essence, the mayor and the commissioner's court as a city council. I have always said the east side, and I'm going to include Bolivar as well, that we are their first line of defense. We are the ones who need to go there and take care of them first. We're very proud of a program we have out there called Trash Bash Day. Or I'm, I'm sure we have some title for it, but I can't remember what it is. For over the last three years, twice a year, we've put out uh, shredders, chippers, and large roll-off containers for waste. People started coming off slowly, and now it's gotten to be so big that sometimes we have to stop the traffic. Uh, and, and one of the things that we do in the program is we chip all of the greenery that's brought in and allow people to take it back as mulch. I think it's a great program for the east side, and we have also increased the number of deputies that are patrolling by increasing the funding for the sheriff's department uh, in the Bayshore area where it's needed the most. For the north side, the north side of the county is largely covered by a Friends Wooden League city. Uh, the cities largely take care of themselves. We need to provide services such as the district clerk and the county clerk, which we do up here at the Calder Annex. But as far as that, uh, beyond that, there's not much that we can do to increase the services. They're just really just not needed up north. All right, Ms. Hatmaker. Well, I have to agree with that as well. I've been out to the San Leon Bay Cliff area, and the services that they desire the most out there are increased law enforcement. Uh, I don't think that you can ever have enough law enforcement in a community. The more law enforcement you have, the lower the crime. Uh, and then you don't want to get rid of uh, or eliminate or reduce your law enforcement presence because then the crime will come come back and will continue to rise. So the east side definitely has requested uh, law enforcement as a priority. Um, when the commissioner's court nearly removed the drug task force, they were very protective of that. And I'm glad to say it's still in place. Uh, in the north area, we're pretty well set. Uh, we do need more assistance in the tax office on Calder Road. I think if you've been in there and tried to pay your tax bill, there have been tremendous lines. And so I think we could add maybe a staff member or two to that particular area. All right, next question up. Uh, somewhat related to this. Uh, residents of the Bolivar Peninsula often complain that they are the stepchildren of the county. Even some have considered de-annexing and moving to Chambers County. Given the area is one of the largest unincorporated parts of the county, how much of a commitment should the county government make to the peninsula? And uh, first up with uh, that is Judge Henry. Obviously, it's part of the county. It's unincorporated county. Once again, we're the line of first defense out there. They are 1% of the county population. We spend a disproportionate amount of money over there, but that's okay. You know, they are part of our, our population. The, um, the, the Chambers County thing, uh, this came up in a redistricting hearing in 2011. They said, we want to move to Chambers County. I took them seriously. So I went and talked to Judge Sylvia in Chambers County and the state legislature. When they found out I was doing that, they said, stop, why are you doing that? I said, because you asked me to. So they do refer to themselves as the stepchildren. And sometimes it's hard to uh, get them to um, be happy about anything, it seems like at times. 
Is that, that into my question? Yeah, there you go. All right, Ms. Hatmaker. See, I see Bolivar Peninsula as a diamond in the rough. I think that it is an area that is prime for development. I think it's an area that is prime for growth. And I think the community over there wants it if it's done properly. You take a look at the west end of Galveston Island and you think about the tax base there. And yes, Bolivar was hit hard. And yes, they've experienced great loss. But what better way to start from the ground up? They should not be feeling like they are the redheaded stepchild. And they do. They've invited me to come over. They're very eager to support me. And they want to hear what I have to say about the, the issues with rollover pass. They're very upset and distraught over the fact that their land has been taken away from them and that they really did not have much of a say-so in it. And that does segue into the next question. What should be happening with rollover pass? And uh, Michelle, you go first. Well, I think from what I understand and what I've learned so far, there was a study done not long after Ike, and evidently the study was uh, paid for by the government, so you can imagine which direction it leaned. Uh, there has been another separate study that's been done, and of course it's on the other side of uh, the fence, so to speak. I think that we need to take a long, hard look at the realities of what is best for that area from every perspective, but as a real estate broker, I know that property rights, especially here in Texas, property rights and gun rights are the most important. And I am totally against the government coming in and taking anything away from me for any reason. All right, County Judge Mark Henry. Uh, she said land was taken away. I'm unaware of that, so I, I need some refresher on who, whose land got taken away. The reality is that the state cut that pass. It's not natural. The reality is that the state owns the water. They don't own the mud underneath it, but they own the water. The state went to the legislature. This legislature blessed them closing the pass. The legislature funded them closing the pass. The one thing they forgot, and I wish they hadn't, was they forgot to give them eminent domain power for that one action. So the state came to us and said, can we uh, use you as a partner and if build, we build a pier out into the ocean? And uh, of course, we deal with the land office on a lot of things. And for us to say, no, we refuse to work with you on that would be very problematic for the other programs that we do. But it's important to know that the legislation was permissive. It, wasn't, it didn't require them to close the pass. We're going to have a new land commissioner in nine months or 10 months. Uh, let's wait and see what the new land commissioner wants to do. We are lo merely a local partner helping the state carry out the, benef or, or the, the wishes of the state. The county personally doesn't have a stake in this. All right, next up. Since this is a party primary election, both of y'all running in the GOP primary, explain your voting history. Have you ever voted in another party primary? If so, how often and how long have you consistently voted in the primary of the party to which you seek the nomination for this office? And uh, Judge Henry, you're first. I have never voted in a Democrat primary. I have been referred to as a 10R, which is kind of a joke because in the political uh, uh, consultant world, three or five R's as high as you can go. I voted in every Republican primary, every Republican primary runoff, every general election as far back as I can remember. And the only hiccups I would have in that is when I was on active duty or deployed by the Air Force because it was oftentimes very difficult to get a mail-in ballot from uh, wherever I happened to be at that time. But absolutely no history in the Democrat Party at all. Ms. Hatmaker. I believe the only Republican primary that I ever missed was 2010. Uh, I am at an age where sometimes you forget things, but uh, to my recollection and my knowledge, I am a hard R, and 2010 was the only Republican primary that I've missed. And just to clarify, you said you missed it. You not vote at all? I did not. No, I voted in the general. I did not vote in the Republican primary. But neither primary that year then, just to make, that's the clarify. I did not vote in a, in a Democratic primary. Gotcha. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right. Um, and this, Michelle, you'll get this question first. Have you accepted campaign contributions from anyone who receives business from the county? That includes firms that are seeking bids from the county for products or services. If so, what can you tell voters to convince them that those contributions would not influence decisions you make if you are elected and on the court? To my knowledge, none of the campaign contributions that have come into my campaign uh, are involved or related to anyone with a contract with the county. All right. 
Judge? I certainly have, and it's uh, very humbling when you work with somebody and they want to support you financially because they'd like to see you stay in office. And it happens repeatedly. And it happens not only with people that have business with the county, it happens with people I've never met and PACs that I have never uh, spoken to, the good government PACs. I never had the pleasure to meet George Mitchell, but he mailed me a check about once a year. So the, the connection between the county and the contributors is really none. No one has ever been promised anything. No one's ever been rewarded with anything. And I never, ever ask them if they wish to donate voluntarily and send it in, I will accept it. But there is no uh, request or, or any kind of tie between the two. All right. Thank you, Judge. All right. Uh, given that the county had approved a plan for consolidated justices of the peace and constable precincts, what can you do, understanding you're working with elected officials to, on Commissioner's Court to ensure that every resident has readily available access to the courts and constable services? Excellent, and I would like to talk about that. Uh, we have successfully consolidated down to four JPs. This is history making. I don't know of any other government who shrunk the number of elected officials. It's big. We have gone from nine JPs to four, from eight constables to four. And what we're going to do to ensure access, uh, and this was something that kept coming up during the, the trial that I sat through three weeks ago, that uh, you're taking away access. We're not taking away access. Every square inch of this county is still covered by a JP court. Every square inch is still covered by a constable. What we intend to do is keep all buildings that formerly housed JPs open. If there is uh, uh, two buildings in that JP precinct, they can use both of them. If they choose not to, I hope they'll get an opponent in four years that will talk about using both buildings. We want the JP to go to the people, not the people go to the JP. We own all of the buildings that, are, that house JPs. We don't lease any of them. So there's no additional expense to the county other than the air conditioning bill, I suppose, to keeping the office available for that JP to make justice available to all the constituents, wh whichever building is closer to them. Ms. Hatmaker. Well, I think the term consolidated successfully is a matter of opinion. If you talk to the JPs and the constables, they may not all necessarily agree. If you talk to Cheryl Johnson, our voter registrar, she can tell you the difficult time she's had in handling the redistricting and the lines. In fact, it ended up costing the county more money because she had to bring a vendor in because the boundaries were cutting precincts into two areas. Um, it did need to be addressed. It is an issue that could have been handled a little bit differently. I think that a cooperative effort between the county commissioners and the voter registrar would have made sense. I think that uh, the fact that I have the support of law enforcement, I have the endorsement of Constable Jimmy Fullen and several others that uh, that clearly states it was not something that was done with agreement and it was not done successfully, especially now that we're dealing with a lawsuit. And as again, the moderator's uh, discretion here, to, uh, the question was is that how would you make sure that this would be implemented? Are you, are you saying that you would go back to the old system? No, what I'm saying is I think that it should have followed the current commissioner the commissioner's boundaries, and that would have probably been the most successful if it needed to be done. And how would you provide access still under that f format? Clarify, please. Well, is it, it part of that, even if that is still at four, the question was, is that how would you ensure that folks still have access to the courts based on that? Well, obviously, we have the, the property, the buildings, the employees. So in place, I think that there would be some restructuring within that, but it would still be made accessible. A little more difficult for Bolivar, but. Good. Okay, that's. I just wanted to make sure we clarified that point. Thank you. All right, uh, next question up. Uh, what should count? What should the county be doing about indigent health care? And that question to you, Ms. Hatmaker. Well, I think that obviously that is part of the county services, and. What we've dealt with uh, with UTMB and the state legislator, legislature regarding indigent health care has been a very prominent focus since Ike. Um, I think that the services that we provide need to be monitored. I think that we need to take into account that we do have people that need assistance, and the county's responsibility should be limited to what the law affords. Okay. Judge Henry, you. Texas uh, law requires that every county provide at least 26% of the federal poverty level for energy and health care bottom. We're currently at 35%, and it did generate a few articles in the Texas oldest newspaper not too long ago, uh, in that we had been at 100% of federal poverty level uh, with an agreement after Hurricane Ike. 
we simply couldn't sustain that anymore. We had $2.3 million budgeted, and we'd already gone to $2.8 million with still three months of the fiscal year left. We could not sustain that level. It's also important to know that's tertiary care. That's the third doctor down the list. At primary and secondary care, in many places in the county, at the Four Seas Clinic, we're at 200 percent of federal poverty level. So the health care is available. They have to be qualified, and that's where they, they get qualified, at the Four Seas Clinic or the Coastal Health and Wellness Center now. But the tertiary care is one that is going to have to be managed because we just can't afford an unlimited uh, checkbook there. It's also interesting to note that while we, we're very good partners with UTMB, UTMB refuses to participate in that program on our tertiary care. They refuse to pay, uh, accept the rates that the county can pay. Thank you, Judge. All right, next question up. Uh, I'd asked you earlier about what program you would cut. How about uh, one you may like within county government you would like to see expanded? And uh, Judge Henry, you get uh, the first crack at this one. Nuisance abatement. He's here, and it's not just because he's here. Garrett Foskett is a star employee. He is what's right about government service. He does a fantastic job of all the jobs that no one wants. Old tires, old cars, garbage in the middle of the roadway. Uh, this is something that, that really, no, who wants that job? Well, he loves it, and he does a great job at it. I would like to see that expanded. Uh, we have, uh, we expanded our veterans program and, it's, and our veteran service officer. We only had one veteran service officer to service 25,000 veterans in this county. I thought that was terrible, so we've doubled it. Now we have two, and they only have 12,500 veterans apiece now. So there are some good programs that I think are very worthy and could stand to have a little bit more added to them. All right, Ms. Hatmaker. Plain and simple mosquito control. No more beyond that. How would you do it, though? Well, I believe that we need to potentially work with the, uh, the, the airplanes. I think we have a problem with the airplanes, if I'm not mistaken. I think that uh, we need to have a better schedule of, mis of scheduling for the mosquito spraying. I think that... Oftentimes, it's not handled as quickly and responsibly as it could be. I know even in my neighborhood up here, it's an issue. Santa Fe has complained that it's an issue out there. Obviously, they have a lot of marshland, and it's a problem. But it's something that we need to monitor very closely. We need to take care for health reasons as well as just pest reasons. Thank you, ma'am. All right, and uh, Ms. Hatmaker, you'll get this question first. There's been a lot in the news in the last year about the Galveston County Animal Resource Center and its operations. There's been a push by many to take away the operation control from the health district. Do you favor that or not, and why, and how? what should be done there? Ms. Hatmaker. Well, once again, those... That situation is something that I am not privy to in in depthly. I can only go by what I've read in the paper. I think that uh, taking it away from the health district may potentially be a positive. Um, I am very much uh, anti-kill. I think that we should monitor the the uh, organization and do what we can to help promote it to get as much volunteer in there uh, volunteerism in there to get as much uh, donations and contributions as we can but I think that's one of those services that the health district could possibly uh, better use their time doing other services judge Henry you're right, it has been in the paper a lot lately. The problems are numerous. Uh, one is that there is a group who wants to treat it like a no-kill facility. It can't be done, really. No-kill facilities get to close their doors and say no more. We don't get to do that. And it's important to note, by the way, uh, stray animals, we're at the end of this train wreck. We're not at the beginning of it. There are better ways to handle a, f a shelter, but we have a hard time managing the shelter because of the bizarre way in which it was set up. We have, I believe, nine partners in the Animal Resource Center, and they all have to nine agree to everything. When's the last time you got two people to agree to everything, much less nine people? So we would like to take a look at the Animal Resource Center, but we can't do it by ourselves. I'll say as county judge, there's not a lot I can do. I'm just one of the nine partners. Personally, though, I have personally written over $3,000 in personal checks, not campaign money, personal money, to facilitate adoptions and get 80-plus animals taken out of the Animal Resource Center. Thank you, Judge. All right, um, next up, and uh, Judge, you'll have this question first. Explain your vision of what role the county judge should play for economic development strategy in Galveston County. 
it should be the leading role within the county. There are very fractured economic development uh, initiatives in the county. Some are fantastic. Texas City Lamarck's fantastic. And in full disclosure, I'm an ex officio board member, but that doesn't taint my perception of how successful they've been. There are other cities who can't afford to have a program on their own or who do it very sporadically and with very, very limited focus. We've just started this initiative. We've talked about it for years. We finally got it underway. We are going to have a one-stop shopping for the county. We've had uh, Friendswood, you know, give us some direction that there are things they're not interested in. Uh, we've had, you know, others say we'll take anything. So the county should be a one-stop shop for anybody wanting to develop in this in the in the county, and be able to direct them to the people that we think are best suited for them, not excluding anyone. We will always make sure everyone's invited to the table when a project comes along, and. Um, that's, that's our role, is to be the, the number one cheerleader for the county and make sure we get the person looking to relocate matched up with the best fit for them as far as the city goes. Ms. Hatmaker. Well, I do believe that the county has a leading role as facilitator, communicator, and coordinator in the fact that we should be working with each of the municipalities to find out what their needs are. Uh, for me, I'm very proactive in my business. As a, a landlord of a multi-tenant property, I find that I like to go out and find tenants. I don't just wait for them to come to me. The state has a method by which they they get information on a daily basis about companies that want to come to Texas. Um, they send letters out to multiple areas to get responses. I think it's important for us to be proactive in working with the state to find out who's coming. I think we should do everything we can to get them to move from San Antonio to here and not just wait for them to come to us. Thank you, ma'am. All right, next, uh, next question up. Uh, understanding that most meetings uh, would have to be in the county seat on Galveston Island, would you support holding regular commissioner court meetings in other parts of the county just to provide more access? Why or why not, Ms. Hatmaker? Well, I believe the county seat is the county seat for a reason. I believe that other areas are available for emergency meetings. I think with the availability of internet and television that the meetings should be continued to be held in the county seat. All right. Judge? To be clear, the statute says that the regularly scheduled commissioner's court must take place in the county seat. That's held about, I believe we only designate one a month as being the regularly scheduled meeting. Why not have it other places? Because eventually you're going to have to. After Hurricane Ike, they had no power at 722 Moody. They couldn't hold commissioner's court there. So we routinely go and make sure that our alternate facilities, Calder Road Annex, Walter Hall Park, and soon to be Santa Fe High School, are operational. We're going to have to go there one day. We don't want to, but we're going to have to. We need to make sure that they are ready, that they are able to stream live from there, and that when we need them in the event of an emergency, they exist and are ready to handle our meetings. Right. Next question up. Uh, this may be right into everyone's wheelhouse here. What will you do if elected or reelected to make the county more taxpayer friendly? County Judge Henry. Continue the track we're on. It's, uh, it's great to be able to come to work and, and, w and drill down on programs and, and expenses to the county and be able to save money and to be able to give that money back to the taxpayers. Uh, I don't know how to create a more friendly environment than uh, someone looking at even the state comptroller's website where it shows our tax rate going down. Uh, the same with the, the size of the government. It's a very unusual thing to have the size of government shrink. We've done it. We've done it three years in a row. When I took office, it was about 1,300 people. Now it's 1,184. We have been very successful in doing the things that I ran on in 2010, and we expect to continue doing those things in the next four years. And could you repeat that again, please? Yeah. What, what if elected mm -hmm. as county judge, uh, what, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, what would you do specifically to make the county more taxpayer friendly? Well, I do believe, once again, in reaching out to businesses, trying to bring more business to the county, and obviously any partnerships that can be accomplished, any business incentives that can be offered are very, very important. I think getting each of the cities on board with becoming business friendly is very important as well because really that's where it's going to start. I know that there are certain cities that are known for being not business friendly, and um, that makes it very difficult to progress forward if, if you don't have everyone's full cooperation. I had the opportunity to try to bring a company to uh, Galveston County and we ran into that and it was very discouraging. So I think incentives and doing anything we can to help them realize the tax savings would be important. All right. 
Uh, the county and the city of Galveston have been in a debate recently about paving Seawall Boulevard. The city wanted the paving done sooner, so it's going ahead and having the road paved, even though uh, city officials believe the county is ultimately responsible for that. Still, the city would like the county to chip in about $250,000 on the cost. This is more a conceptual thing. What should be done about seawall paving now, and should that continue to be a county project, or should it be just shared cost-wise in the future? And uh, uh, Michelle, I'm sorry, Judge Henry, this is yours. Sure. The county owns the seawall. It does everything it needs to do to maintain the structural integrity of that seawall. Seawall paving or the blacktop on the road at this point in time is not necessary for the structural integrity. The Army of Corps of Engineers agreed with us. They issued us a five-year letter last year in 2013 saying you have at least five years before you have a structural integrity issue. So now we're down to just a benefit of promoting tourism and making it more pleasant for the people who live there. That's not a county function. And I know the city disagrees with us, but we just have to agree to disagree on that. And conceptually, if we're down to just paving a road, we don't pave roads in Friendswood. We don't pave roads in League City, although I saw Mayor Paulson walk in. I'm sure he'd like for us to. But we just don't do that. We will always maintain the structural integrity of that seawall. We will not be in a position to be able to pave streets for the city of Galveston. Ms. Hatmaker, are you? For me, that is also a rather loaded question. I have businesses in Galveston, and I know that Galvestonians count on me to take up for them. Uh, not being involved in the past 10, 20 years and knowing how it was handled, uh, I would have to say that I would disagree because I think there was just an understanding. And if that has been the way it's been for so long, then it needs to be discussed before it's just cut off. The issue isn't necessarily with the fact that the paving isn't going to be done. It was the manner by which it was handled. The city of Galveston was just abruptly told after it assumed the commitment was there that the money would not be available. And now that um, the commissioners are in a partnership and needing $400,000 from the city to move forward with the Pelican Island Bridge, I would be curious to see what negotiations transpire on both sides. All right. Thank you. Uh, and uh, maybe we may get two more questions in before closing statements in uh, about what is your vision for the county park system? Uh, we have obviously Jack Brooks Park, uh, the parks ever in uh, Dickinson, uh, League City, uh, the Washington Park in Galveston. What's your vision for how those parks should be managed? Should they be more of the stay under county control or should it be more of a partnership or handed over to the cities? Well, looking at other counties, I know that um, Ed Emmett has promoted and been very proud of the fact that their commissioners have taken personal involvement in roles with their parks. I think that by doing that, the county shows their interest in our quality of life. Um, I do think that it does have to be managed carefully, but our parks are a part of our, our life. It's where we raise our children and we have our picnics and we, we have our community. And the county has a role in that. I think that uh, giving them back to the cities uh, and putting that burden on them would strain our communities, and that's not something that we need to do necessarily, although it does need to be looked at very carefully and managed very carefully. Judge Henry. Harris County, if it was a city, the unincorporated part would be the big, fifth largest city in the country. We cannot compare ourselves to Harris County. Our unincorporated parts of uh, Galveston County comprise about 16 or 17 percent of the county. But we have, as a commissioner's court, all in agreement, decided that we should focus on regional parks and on parks in unincorporated county. Regional parks are Jack Brooks and Walter Hall. It's also important to note that the way we acquired those parks, they must always be maintained by the county and always be maintained as a park. So we can't get rid of those, and we have no intention of getting rid of those. There are some other parks that serve strictly a city, and we are asking the cities to take over operation of those parks. The county doesn't really get any benefit from it, but we have to maintain all the costs of, of maintaining the park, and that can get to be expensive. So smaller parks located within city limits, we as a court have agreed we would ask that the city take those over. None of them have done it yet, but we're still working on it, and we're hopeful. Uh, but as far as unincorporated area, we have a new 64-acre park in Bayshore that will start developing here in the very, and probably within the next year, and then the two regional parks, Jack Brooks and Walter Hall time all right and it was brought up earlier but it was actually it's going to be our last question of the night uh, because as summer approaches we will hear this a lot 
what can be done to improve mosquito control in Galveston County? And uh, Judge Henry, you get to go first. No one's going to like this answer, but our mosquito control program is successful. We don't do it so you don't have to buy off. We do it so that there's no spread of West Nile virus. We've been very successful using that as our measuring stick because that's what we're here for. We do have a very competent mosquito control program. I don't think there's anything wrong with the airplane. That was the first I heard of that tonight. Uh, they spray on a regular schedule. They post that schedule on the website, and you can go down and see when the next time they're spraying your neighborhood with trucks and the next time that they're spraying marshy areas with airplanes. Uh, again, unfortunately, mosquitoes are a pest. I, I get bitten as much as anybody else, but we do not have airborne diseases being transmitted via mosquitoes to any large degree, and that's all that the county mosquito control is for. It's also important to note any city can run mosquito control themselves. The county is not the only authority of mosquito control. So if you live in a city and you want to see more spraying, ask your city to start mosquito control spraying in your city. All right, Ms. Hatmaker. Well, once again, I think we need to be more responsive and more proactive in taking an advanced approach to the situation with mosquitoes. Uh, obviously, it is a health hazard, not just a, a pest hazard. And I have heard while I've been out that uh, the communities are concerned about it. Uh, like I said, especially the Santa Fe area, um, obviously Galveston will always have an immense problem. Uh, east side will, as you get over into the San Leon, uh, Bay Cliff areas, but right here in League City, we deal with it. And I would like to see a more active and responsive approach when, when we know that we're going to be having a problem. All right. Thank you all very much for both of you for answering our questions tonight. Time now for our closing uh, statements and uh, one minute each. And uh, since Ms. Hatmaker started off our session, Judge Henry, you get to start off the closing statements. Sure. Thank you. And thank you all for coming out. Your time is probably the most valuable thing you have to offer. In 2010, when I ran for county judge, I made some pretty big promises. And I'm proud to sit here and say I've delivered on all of them. I've either accomplished them or made significant strides toward them. There were some things, oh, let me back up, tax rate cuts, uh, property uh, tax rate cuts, reduction of the size of government and paying off bond debt early. There were some other things that I wasn't aware of, and I'm very proud to have accomplished those, and one is establishing only the ninth Veterans Court in the state of Texas. This is a fantastic program, which I am privileged to, to preside over, and it's a non-adversarial treatment court. It's not a trial court. We take a veteran who has uh, become justice involved is the politically correct term for getting arrested. We take a veteran who's become justice involved, put them in a one-year program that mirrors their accession into the U.S. military, and when they graduate successfully, that charge comes off their record. Things like that that I didn't know existed back then. I'm very proud to say that we have done. We are becoming cutting edge in Galveston County, or from worst to first, as I like to say. Ms. Hatmaker. Well, I would also like to thank you for being here this evening. As I said, when I when I first introduced myself. Nine months ago, I began this journey, and I had nine months to change my mind. I haven't. I'm here because I still believe that there are things that need to be changed. I think we need strong leadership. I think up until today, we've all received mailers and heard a constant, I've saved you taxes. Um, I don't know about you, uh, but my tax bills weren't lower. There is a definite difference between saying, we've lowered the effective tax rate, and I saved you money in theory maybe, but not in reality. Be a smart and wise voter. Be educated. You need someone that has strong communication, strong leadership skills, and can pull the team of Galveston County together to move us forward. We have great opportunities. My business experience, my longevity here in the, con in the county, my integrity, they all stand for who I am. I've never had bankruptcies. I've never been investigated by the government. Time. I don't have hidden records. Time, uh, thank you all both for your participation tonight. Thank you all for coming out. A, hand, a round of applause for our candidates here tonight, please. As I had said earlier, this is the first of four forums that the Galveston County Daily News will sponsor. Our next one will be Monday night at the College of the Mainland, where we will be featuring the JP Precinct 1, County District Attorney and State Representatives District 23. The next Thursday at Santa Fe High School, JP Precinct 2, and the County Commissioner Precinct 2 races. And then the final one will be the day before early voting, the, the jury assembly room at the uh, Justice Administration building on the island, uh, JP Precinct 3, and the 212th and 300 
106 district court uh, candidates will be there. And as I said earlier, for those that missed it, uh, happy Valentine's Day to you. We'll have a delivery for you in your paper, the special election section, uh, which I have understand uh, almost every candidate in the, who's running is participating in that. And then starting this weekend on Sunday, we'll debut online the uh, our version of the uh, candidate questionnaires. And as I said earlier, all but one candidate running for office filled out the questionnaires this year. It's our best response on that. And that was something our readers asked us to start doing about six years ago. And it's been one of the better things where folks can see the questions and see the answers in the candidates' words all the way through. We, we uh, remind you, early voting starts on February 18th, ends February uh, 28th, and primary election day is March 4th. Thank you all very much for coming out, and thank you to the candidates again.